There we go. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Agile 42 Connect event today. I'm very happy to be here with my colleague Suzanne as the co-hosts today of the, the panel discussion. This is the first event uh, going on this week, so we are really happy to see this many of you with us today. Um, my name is Suzanne's colleague Peter is going to be the moderator today, and I'm soon going to give him the word where he can start to present the panel that we have here. The session will be recorded and you will all be um, seeing the recording on social media and on our website afterwards as well. Uh, if you want to chat with us during the panel, please feel free to do that. Uh, remember to tick in the blue box that you're chatting to all panelists and attendees so that we are all uh, aware of what you're saying. You can also ask questions to everyone in the panel and this is best done through the Q&A session. So please put everything in the Q&A so that we can keep track on your questions. Um, there's also a donation if you want to donate uh, and help us to help other people. So please uh, go in and do the donation. My colleague Suzanne will put the link uh, in the chat for you. Um, and also if you haven't signed up for the other webinars happening this week, there's going to be a link uh, also to that. I think that was it. Peter, you're welcome. Stage is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Fia. And thanks everybody for joining us and a big thank you to our panelists for making themselves available for this session, which I think is going to be fascinating. So let's dive straight in. So I'm going to do a brief introduction of all the panelists and then um, start the first round of questions. So Christoph Bornschein is CEO and one of the founders of TLGG, a digital transformation agency with offices in Berlin and New York. He and, he and his team counsel international companies and brands in the strategic use of digital technologies, building out new organizational um, innovation infrastructures and development of new business models. So, that qualifies him, I believe, to, to really speak to us with authority um, in this time that we're talking about. Next, um, Richard Sheridan. Richard's passion is for creating joyful work environments. He's written two best-selling um, books, Joy Inc. and the more recent um, Chief Joy Officer. He co-founded Menlo Innovations which is a software development company. And in recent years, thousands of people have visited Menlo and been inspired to see this joyful workplace in action. So welcome, Richard. I think we're going to learn a lot from you. Next up, Tim Moyes. Tim is Sipgate CEO and co-founder. Tim strives for innovative network and mobile phone products for organizations as well as individuals. And I think it's going to be very interesting to hear from Tim how um, the COVID pandemic has influenced his business and perhaps vice versa. Next up, to, Tobias Schiewek, um, or Tobias probably, should better pronunciation in, in German, is responsible for international business of Europe's new generation media company, Divimore, which is part of the RTL group as CEO. So Tobias is an expert in how to grow your brand in the, in the digital space. So again, going to be very interesting to hear how COVID has impacted your work. Um, Sonia Blichnot has kindly joined us at short notice to replace uh, Victoria, who sadly is sick today. Um, Sonia wears multiple hats. She's the founder and CEO of More Beyond, a consulting company, but she's here today as CEO of Cognitive Edge, which is the home of the Kinevin framework and SenseMaker technology. Sonia has worked with Dave Snowden for many years and is herself an international authority on complexity. So I'm certainly looking forward to what you have to tell us, Sonia, about um, this complex situation we find ourselves in right now. And last but not least, Andrea Tomasini, CEO and co-founder of Agile 42, 
um, Andrea is a strategic coach to leaders and organizations worldwide, helping them on their path to resilience, to greater resilience. Andrea is also the driving force behind organic agility, which is the Agile 42 way of helping organizations transform. So welcome, Andrea. So let's proceed. I would like to do a round where each of you, can you hear us, Tobias? You're okay, good. I'd like to do it around with each of you just to um, give your own perspective on what has been um, the impact of COVID-19, which began for most of us in March. So we've been, we've been living with this for about four months. What's been the impact on you personally and how has it affected your business? Um, let's start with you, Tobias. Awesome. Personally, uh, I've never been so much at home uh, in the consecutive order of days, which is amazing. Um, before I should explain why something can happen through video conference and how it seems doable. So I actually had some profit from the new normal. As it was uh, uh, for us, uh, the real life test of our agile methodology that we just started to implement and is already ready to go into a real life test which we had five bridges going on and all those companies were now looking into a centralized uh, business setup got an uh, office right out of Berlin to nine offices but we announced the remote office on a Friday morning and four hours later we had everybody in the kitchen on um, a video Zoom conference and it seemed like um, I mean as far as you can say something like that the infrastructure was at least prepared for real distributed setup and so it was real life test at least. Breaking up. A little bit, Peter, you're muted. Thank you. Sonia, let's go to you next. Um, thanks, Peter. Sure, it's it's actually quite a hard question to answer. You know, I, I um I even find myself nowadays when people just ask me how are you that I have to really think about the answer to that question. I think um Personally, my experience has been um, almost like a complete dissolution of boundaries. You know, I, I find um, I am on continuous back-to-back -back Zoom calls. Um, it's really difficult to, you know, whereas in the past we had r routines and boundaries that helped us make identity transitions, you know, so... Sonia the consultant and Sonia the cook and Sonia the grocery shopper were kind of, you know, different um, uh, identities. And now I find that they're just all here at the same time. So personally, I, I find that um, it, it's quite difficult to navigate this new boundaryless environment. Um, from a work perspective, um, not too much has, has changed, actually. I think, you know, I've, I've been um, consulting um, you know, virtually for, for quite a while. So um, business is actually going pretty well. Um, on the cognitive edge side of things, you know, we find, um, again, these boundaries that just kind of disappeared. So we work across multiple time zones. Um, and I think one of the key things that I'm seeing there is although we're, we're really busy and we've got a lot of, of work, um, what we really need to watch out for is, is burnout because it, it, it's really become a problem for people to just manage boundaries. So I think um, that's become one of my favorite words, boundaries, because I, I find that it, it really, whereas in the past we had you know, physical boundaries, now we have to put them in place ourselves. So from a business and a personal perspective, I think that probably sums up most of, of my experience. Okay, thanks. That's interesting. Yes, um, it resonates with me. My wife is a clinical psychologist and she is helping um, health workers in the COVID pandemic to deal with, um, you know, stress as that they're experiencing. Great. So let's move on. Christoph, can we hear from you? 
<clears throat> sure. Um, and um, my take is not too far away from what Sonia just said. Um, so being a kind of, or having been a global traveler uh, for business with 250 travel days a year, um, I kind of never had a period in time in my whole grown up life uh, that I stayed in one place for such a long while um, and had to experience such a density of work. And that is really what, um, what, 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 what brought me to a point where I just came back from vacation. Um, the four months of Corona felt like a full year um, when it came down to um, stress levels um, and really being stressed out um, for back to back calls and stuff like that. Um, what, what I'm missing a lot really is the kind of uh, social interaction, um, uh, the, the credit it gives you, um, the, the, the kind of motivation. My motivation system um, needs in room meetings. Um, so, business wise, I'm coping. Um, it's all good. From a professional standpoint, everything works out fine. I just don't like it. So it's it's really a um, intellectually I'm I'm totally with um, my CO two footprint has never been so low um, uh, I'm doing all the right things but I don't like it. Okay, yeah, interesting. All right, um, Tim, can we come to you? Of course. Um, the number one thing for me actually is the location that changed. Uh, sitting at home uh, is different, and I still struggle to understand every single day that not everybody else is at the office and I'm the only person at home, but that everybody's at home. Um, and um, except for the fact that um, I, I, I enjoy the fact that I don't have to commute. I mean, I just live down the street from the office, so it's maybe 15 minutes. And uh, I've been to the office um, last week and it was really a struggle to um, get those 15 minutes right and be there on time because I really lost the ability to uh, factor in my commute. Uh, I enjoy that. That's really, really nice. Um, uh, I'm not much of a travel business traveler, so there's not much that changed there. And we kept our team structures um, alive and they're working the same way as they were in the office. That really helped make the transition easy. Um, and what my, uh, what uh, the other panelists said, um, I also feel a lot of stress. The first day we moved to the home office, uh, I, after eight hours, I was uh, I was like in a mental breakdown kind of state because it was so stressful, and it, that has not it's it's gotten a lot better, but it's not gone yet. And I think uh, it, that this relearning of how to work and how to work sustainably that that's something uh, uh, which will I will be focusing on for the next couple of months. Okay, great. Thanks, Tim. Um, Richard, I'd like to come to you. Yeah, well, anybody who knows Menlo knows that uh, we are a company that values being in person, in the room together, sharing a computer, keyboard, and mouse, standing in a big circle and a daily stand-up meeting, passing around a two-horned plastic biking helmet to control the meeting. Uh, I think we created the most positive, contagious environment ever. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, the shift for us was swift, it was dramatic, and it was unnerving. And I would say that my sleep was disturbed for at least 90 days. Uh, probably still not quite back on track, but I think for 90 days I was running in this maze, just a single hallway maze. Run into the wall, look for the cheese, no cheese. Turn around, <laughs> run into the wall, no cheese. Finally, uh, about 90 days into this, I looked up and said, oh, there's no ceiling to this maze. I'm going to crawl out of it and see what's out there. Um, so uh, we have adjusted. It's uh, the best way I can describe Menlo now is it's weird, but it's working. Uh, I know we're doing a, a virtual tour with uh, folks uh, from this community tomorrow, so you get a chance to see it. Um, and uh, you know, I, I my my immediate personal impact was my calendar just emptied. I had all of these places I was going to go and conferences I was going to speak at, people I was going to go see, and then just gone. And I think I had the equivalent of agoraphobia, that fear of wide open places. When I looked at my calendar, I'm like, what am I going to do? And delightfully, it has refilled again, of course, with things like this. Uh, so I feel a little bit more stable now. Uh, the business itself uh, was dramatically impacted because uh, we are often working on big projects, uh, often for big companies and small companies, and uh, a lot of people have pulled back 
being very cautious with their cash and that sort of thing. Uh, we're still doing fine. We, we've mapped out the financials. We're gonna we're gonna survive into 2021. Uh, but um, uh, it's been uh, been a challenge, but it's been fun to watch how the team has responded to it as well. Okay, cool. Thanks, Richard. Andrea, what do you? <laughs> There's not much left to add. I think uh, all the aspects were covered, but from a personal perspective, I mean, the first reaction was really like, shit, this is happening for real. And uh, um, I'm Italian. I had uh, folks in Italy, still family there and friends, and we also have uh, colleagues in Italy. And uh, we, we started hearing the news, but when you hear it from people you know and you see how the situation was going completely crazy, it was a different story. So in a way, we've been lucky because we kind of had the chance, thanks to our Italian colleagues, and I said it this morning as well, uh, to actually get a little bit prepared. Uh, from a business perspective, um, I think uh, we managed to, to adapt very, very quickly to the situation, and we are now in a state where we can survive, so we are, we are good uh, uh, with remote work. The biggest problem for us has been that uh, many of our clients weren't ready to work remotely, so we had to help them a little bit. Many thought they could sit this one out and just wait it for, you know, pass by and forget about it, but they are realizing they can't sit this one out. It's going to take a bit longer than expected probably we're gonna have uh, until mid next year I guess uh, still a, a situation in which uh, everything will not be as normal as we want to but just as a, as a data point all of our client already said that even if things will go back to normal again they would still probably have at least 50 percent of uh, work remote at least uh, which makes me a little bit sad, like uh, Christoph and like Richard, I am a person who loves to be in a room with other people and I need that as motivation. I need that smell of uncertainty, that smell of fear, that smell of happiness that uh, kind of uh, comes when you are together and try to achieve things and move post it around and all of a sudden, bomb, the realization is there. So with digital media, we are not yet at that level that I would like. But we are good. We are going on and yes, we are coping. Okay. <clears throat> all right. So thank you all. Um, we've kind of got ourselves into the room, I think. And now I'd like to explore a little bit about what you think this new normal that people talk about might look like. So if you do some crystal ball, gazing or you look at what has happened so far that you think will uh, will persist in the in the months beyond um, where we are today what, what do you think a new normal might be um, where should we start let's come to you Sonia thank you Peter <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't know. I think the one thing that I do know is um, our whole concept of normal has, has been disrupted. You know, I think um, whatever normal looks like, I think we're going to be in perpetual uncertainty. And I think the volatility is, is just going to continue. So um, the one, um, you know, we had the brief conversation before this, um, before the session as well. I think the, the one narrative that is being completely disrupted is that stability is normal and then we have these periods of instability and uncertainty and then we go back to some kind of a normal which we don't really know what it looks like but we think it's going to be predictable and stable and i think what we're realizing is that the uncertainty and instability is normal and these stable periods are the abnormal um so i i don't really know um how all of this is going to play out i similar to what andrea is saying uh, many of the the corporate clients that I work with in South Africa, at least, are already um, making the um, working from home permanent. So I think working from, from home, virtual working is probably in some form going to persist. Um, something that I'm not seeing and that I, I really hope will, will develop um, in this so-called new normal is I'm not seeing organizations adapt their performance expectations of their people. 
um, to accommodate the new working in environment. So people are under tremendous pressure. Um, they've still got exactly the same targets and, and performance e expectations. Um, and simply working from home is, you know, I, I don't think that we realize the psychological impact of having children at home, um, the trauma of being in the middle of a pan pandemic and then expecting people to perform at the same levels while under the stress of knowing that other people are being laid off. So I'm, I'm really hoping that we'll start to see um, greater adaptations in terms of the structuring of our organizations to accommodate this new world of working. Mm. That's interesting. My next door neighbor is an architect and she, I bumped into her and our schools in South Africa are closed for the next month. And she said, oh, what am I going to do? My kids are at home for another month. So, yes. Okay. So who, somebody want to respond to what Sonia has said? Richard. Yeah, I think, you know, we're going to see, um, you know, like I'm, I, I think, you know, if I look at all the prognostication that happened at the beginning of this, I, I think everybody thought oh, this would be about eight weeks and then we'll be back to normal. And if it were only eight weeks, we would have been fine but it's not eight weeks. This, we might be uh, inside of this cloud of pandemic for 18 months to two years before any attempt at getting back to normal could be even possible. So I think anytime you change human behavior for that length of time, things permanently change. And I think of this particular group gathered under this umbrella of agility, boy oh boy, <laughs> I thought I knew agility before. Wow. What we have to adapt to right now is almost the very definition of agility. Uh, and so I think we're going to see permanent changes. I, I don't think the pendulum is going to swing all the way one way or swing all the way back the other way. But we'll see a hybrid environment come out of this. Uh, I know personally that my beliefs have changed about is it okay for people to be home working remotely, uh, patching into Menlo to do our pair programming and that sort of thing? And we've proven that it works. It doesn't work equally well for everyone. As Sonia said, uh, the pressure on parents of young children is tremendous right now. Uh, they're having to balance their lives of being, you know, uh, how many of us have gotten just used to a child jumping up on a parent's lap inside of a Zoom meeting? Heck, it might happen so in the midst of this particular call. Uh, and that's okay. You know, I think that one of the things I've seen come out of this that I think is quite beneficial is we're getting a deeper peek into the lives of the people that work for us. We're seeing more of the humanness of our team members, whether it's their cats, their dogs, their children, what they keep on the, uh, on the shelf at their house or anything like that. So um, I think we've gotten more connected in some odd ways, even though we're not in proximity of one another. So we're in a time of tremendous change. Uh, our ability to be agile is paramount importance right now, probably more than it's ever been before. And whatever happens next is going to be different than what we were used to. And I think we just have to come to grips with that. Yeah. Tim, perhaps we can come to you. Uh, you said earlier that you'd managed to keep the teams, um, the same teams working together. Well, um, tell us about that. Um, we, we, as Richard, uh, we strongly believe in co-location, so our uh, teams do live in one single room at the, at the office and uh, they have their rituals and uh, their uh, timetables and everything uh, synced, for, had that for years now. And um, all of that moved to, uh, to remote. Uh, and within, I'd say, two or three days, you have the exact, exact uh, same um, schedules, uh, meetings and everything. And everybody gets into this, um, uh, uh, in this video conferencing room early in the morning and stays there for the entire day and sometimes has break out sessions but uh, you can always go into the team channel and meet people there and um, so there isn't much that changed um, uh, in that regard and um, that works 
I'd say very well. The uh, the only thing not working so quite well are the softer social parts. Um, so I heard about companies having their meet my pet Zoom calls and stuff like that. And um, I think while being at the office, having a beer or coffee with someone is, is obviously part of work. But when you're at home and uh, you have the opportunity to either spend time with your kids or have a, a meet my pet Zoom meeting, uh, it's obviously going to be the kids thing. So um, uh, that kind of that doesn't work out so well yet. But we'll find a way to to work around that. I'm sure. Okay. <clears throat> Who wants to go next? Christoph. So I, I tend to kind of look at that from a micro slash macro perspective. So on, on the micro perspective, um, kind of the individuals, I couldn't agree more with what has been said. Um, I, I think the, the future of the office, um, uh, that's one thing where we just had the architect here uh, to rebuild our office, get away all those desks um, and get more collaboration space in. So having people sit on desks in the office might actually be the past now. Um, so from, from kind of a micro level, I'm, I'm, I'm with you. Um, for me and, and most of our clients, the, the kind of macro perspective is really interesting. Um, really see what it does uh, when it comes down to globalization, global supply chains. Um, and I think what we're seeing, and, and we had conversations like that quite a lot, is that business models with a high capital lockup uh, or tie-up um, will change. Um, we saw that um, the willingness to invest into machine parks, um, into factories has gone down already. The willingness to build buildings has gone down. Um, what we're learning and seeing is that on the top of organizations, we really now have a situation where um, that portfolio of bets that, that most of us have been talking about uh, prior to the corona crisis now really is reality in all of those fields. Even building a factory is a bet now. Um, so you'd rather not invest more than you would need to. So what we're seeing really is um, agility in decision-making processes that have never had agility infused into that. So try to not lock up um, a lot of capital, try to behave like a venture capitalist and keep a dry powder, as they would say, um, really becomes a treat in business life. Um, and that on one hand side is really interesting to see um, because it's opening up perspectives on as a service business models um, for machines, for example. So new business models coming to the table, which is really interesting. Um, and on the other hand side, I'm really in, in, in deep worry on uh, what globalization has been uh, bringing to us and, and whether this is going to be persistent um, over the next time. So um, having an office in New York and only having a European passport basically keeps me out of the U.S. for the next whatever months um, uh, to see. And I think that is not going to help um, global business models, um, global understanding, global communities. Um, and it's really going to be interesting to see on a societal level um, how we all going to cope um, in multilateral communication um, and discussion. Um, I think that is really going to tough. Will our societies learn um, that a virtual meeting um, in political conflicts um, is there to, to, to solve for that, um, to build um, massive transatlantic um, trade agreements and stuff like that. So I'm, I'm really holding back investments that we originally wanted to plan um, into the US because I simply don't know whether European US trade is going to come back to a point where it used to be. Um, same is true for, for China. So on a broader kind of macro perspective, I think that we've seen uh, what we've seen through um, Corona is really going to influence the way we do business in general, not just on a micro level. Okay. Andrea. Yes. Um, so um, I agree with, with what has been said. I also think that micro and macro are two different things. And uh, for, for that, I agree with Christoph. From a micro perspective, when we look at our own company, our main concern as CEO is to provide safety. Uh, and to provide uh, uh, safety means also economical safety for our employees. They have family, they have kids, uh, they have to go ahead. So we need to figure it out. What, what we did at Agile 42, we started working in what we call family mode. So no matter which country you are in, we try to share all of the money in one pot and then we make sure that everybody uh, stays alive. So we have different flow of, of, of cash going on. And we also, uh, which is not to be underestimated, we switch from being a, a network of local businesses to become a single global business because now we are delivering things digitally 
uh, online. And it's not about digitalization, it's about the fact that now in uh, one or two or three time zone difference, we are basically competing, competing globally now with everybody else who was providing service, while our strategy has been before to actually build the local market around community, to build trust uh, so that people would come uh, and visit our session and workshop. So that, that thing is, uh, is changing. And, and I think it will remain uh, the same way. And from a global economic perspective, I also am uh, quite concerned. And I think uh, the only thing that a uh, company can do in these days is to remain cautious, to diversify as much as possible their portfolio, to limit capital investment to the minimum, and make sure that uh, you try to keep the feet on as many platforms as possible until there is anything uh, actually definitely be uh, coming as, as, a, as a solution, as a, as a support. And I, I'm, what I'm worried about is that I don't see, to be honest, yet any new business model which is actually creating value for the situation in which we are in. I rather see a lot of existing business model which shifted the way they deliver, but fundamentally we are taking away money from the market from where it was already before. And unfortunately, COVID exposed the uh, uh, diversity even more uh, to a certain extent uh, because the country who had the money, who, who got the finance, government, uh, government finance uh, to keep the business running are probably on a micro level surviving. But on the other end, the whole supply chain, the end to end uh, manufacturing, the production of goods is broken because in the supply chain, there are also countries like China or like even Southern European country where uh, the government don't have that amount of money to actually keep the business running. And so there are pieces missing. So we still need to figure out all of this. And especially I think as European Union, we should uh, start thinking more as European Union as a separate countries, if we want to actually make an impact uh, on a global economy again and try to recover from the current situation. Yeah, the, I, I, I've been wondering to, you know, to what extent some of the things that are going on are really related to COVID and to what extent they are simply global mac macroeconomic trends. Uh, if you follow what Ray Dalio is publishing at the moment um, with a big arc, it, it looks like the, the dollar is seriously in decline and a new world order is going to come about in the, in the next decade or two. But anyway, I'm not the panelist. So, Tobias, let's get your view. We, we don't hear you at the moment. Yes, the audio on phone, probably. Okay. Unfortunately, we can't hear you. So, um, um, let's try to resolve that. Um, perhaps... Um, Somebody can help you. In the, in the meantime, let's carry on to uh, maybe the, the, the next level. Um, I'm curious to know uh, about what you've discovered about, about business models, like what has worked that, you, that you've kept going? What have you had to change? Anybody got some comments on that? Richard. You know, a big part of Menlo was all these people coming from all over the world, getting on airplanes uh, by the thousands every year coming to visit us. And of course now there's nothing to visit and people can't get on airplanes anymore and come stay. And so there's no hotel rooms, there's no flights, there's no visitors, there's no classes at Menlo. And uh, uh, for about 90 days of this pandemic, that was true for us. And then we had a friend ask us how we were doing, kind of similar to this discussion. And I mentioned to him, I said, would you like to get a virtual tour of a virtual Menlo? And he signed up for it immediately. And now we are doing about a dozen of them a week. And uh, What's neat about it is probably similar to what Andrea was saying, uh, the audience for these virtual tours is truly global. Uh, and I think there's <laughs> democratization that's happening on our tours that wasn't ever available before because 
uh, one of the first tours was three people in New Zealand that I'm pretty sure would have never gotten permission to buy the tickets, take the trip, buy the hotel room and come see us. But within just an hour's time frame, uh, with no travel costs at all, they could come visit us. Uh, and so we're seeing this global audience now for our tours. And um, uh, we expect that to continue. It's gotten our team excited about what else can we do virtually that we had never done virtually before. Uh, because that's a big part of our, um, uh, our business development pipeline as well. A lot, a lot of our customers have come out of those tours. People have come see us, get to know us understand what we're capable of doing, how we do it, why the way we do it is so interesting and important. And then they want us to work on their stuff. And if, when that tour and class pipeline ended, uh, that's probably was the first heart attack I had in all of this because I wondered where would the new business come from if it wasn't coming from this thing we relied on for 19 years. So uh, that transition was swift uh it was dramatic uh upswing uh delightfully and the team's having a lot of fun with it now okay cool um tobias i'm not sure if we've got audio from you now do we want to try let's give it a try ah we hear you good okay do you want to add something from your perspective on the business models? I switched off video. Maybe that is better than. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, great. Um, let's give it a try. So sorry, I did not hear the question. <laughs> I was just starting with the phone. Sure. I mean, what what I was interested in in hearing about, and Richard kicked us off, is is um, what's happening with business models. Are you able to pursue the same model? Are you seeing new models coming out um, in in as you respond to the pandemic? Andrea said. Uh, revolution. We've seen some evolutions, and I think those that have been a one-trick pony are now really under pressure. Um, so, if you if you look into the YouTube world, a lot of them um, had a, a good time at the beginning when traffic was going up, but then CPM went down dramatically, and now they have value streams. Um, so, but I think in in the long run, we will see new models as as Christoph said already, investments into office space, into factories, um, ownership over access will be uh, a topic that will be uh, uh, will run into a revival that we had 20 years ago, maybe. And if you look into our own model, what we see and what I think will be a discussion society in general in the future is the role of social networks. So if everybody's sitting back at home and um, is creating their own filter bubble again, also in, in terms of attitude towards life, they will now be more and more in, uh, in affairs where they have no, no outer effect of colleagues and friends who will have them find an attitude towards life. They will now focus more and more into social groups that are alike. And that will be a huge discussion in the future to me. What, what is your attitude towards life? Does the old structure of a, even a state or religion still give you, give you an orientation or is it a social network? And that will have huge impact on a lot of business models as well. Mm, that's interesting. Um, one of the observations that I've heard made is that uh, people on social networks feel much freer to behave badly because, and, and the reason is that there isn't somebody in front of you to punch you in the face. Uh, yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> True. Um, what, what's been your um, experience are you able to stick with the same business model or are you seeing things change we were in the middle of a transformation so um we could see that the changes came luckily enough in uh, early enough so if you took us a year ago we were the pony solely focusing on adsense revenues on youtube and that um, was already at the beginning of this year probably 50 percent of our revenue now it's even less 
and it helped us very much to have, let's say, studio business where we produce video for, for clients. And, and now we were at least prepared to reach out to them and tell them, look, we do not have to stop shooting uh, most of the videos and we can still tell the same story, have the same narrative, but we do it from remote. So our directors had a sky session looking into the uh, apartment of an actor and we told them, look, scene three will be in your living room when, when you sit on that couch and take four will be uh, in your kitchen sitting on that chair. And, uh, and then we send everything back digitally into post-production and that guy was doing the post-production and the cutting on a kitchen table by himself in, in his living room. Um, so at least we could adapt to that. Um, but surely it changed how we worked. Uh, usually you go on set four to five times before you shoot and now we just made it with a more Skype session beforehand. And then on, on a bigger level, I mean, as I said, we had the, the real so in some territories like Italy, we had double of the reach compared to before on YouTube and other social networks, but the CPMs were half. So if you look on the, on the EBIT level, you were basically at the same again. Okay, interesting. Tim, let's come to you. Um, we saw a spike in demand for our products as um, we help businesses to uh, um, uh, distribute their phone calls. So when people move to the home office, they would use our solutions for that. Um, but that worked out pretty, pretty well for us. And uh, we were able to handle that uh, demand. Um, apart from that, things that changed, uh, we immediately stopped looking for new offices, which uh, we did for years uh, before this came along. And I don't think we're gonna ever uh, um, have more office space than we have today. Uh, that's definitely gonna change. Um, You're yeah, such a lucky guy. I rented one and a half thousand square meters before uh, the crisis started to happen, which are basically empty. Uh, we've got a badminton slash speedminton field on them right now. So um, be happy. It's the most expensive badminton um, uh, place in Berlin, I assume. <laughs> that sounds good. Um, this is my son, John, by the way. Say hi. Hello, John. <laughs> <laughs> and um, uh, one thing that works out really well for us is uh, hiring. We're hiring and uh, we do have um, uh, what we call peer recruiting, which means that everybody in the company is involved in the process. Just one second. It's a thought. <laughs> and uh, uh, we, we switched that to remote without uh, any problems. That worked out uh, really well. So we have... Um, uh, uh, just regular meetings with uh, prospects and then we do uh, training days or single day uh, uh, like test days and we do that remotely and works out uh, very well so we're happy with that. That's good to hear. Sonia, what's been the impact for you? I think, um, Peter, what I've seen with COVID-19 is it, it's on, on the one hand, it's accelerated things that's already been ongoing. Um, and on the other hand, I think it's, 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 it's interesting. It's been an equalizer on the one hand, you know, so and Andrea mentioned this as well. You know, some of the things that we've had to do, we also had um, accredited trainers all, all over the world delivering training locally. And we realized that we needed to pull that back in and, and centralize. Otherwise, we would have had, we would have been competing with ourselves in, different, in, in the same time zones. So there was an equalizing effect um, on the one hand, but on the other hand, it, it also creates a lot of, um, it, it, it enhances the differences or it, it, it makes the differences more um, acute in, in a certain way. Um, one of the things that the things that we were already doing that's been accelerated now is really tapping into our network. So what we're seeing, we've got lots of independent um, people in our, in our network, independent practitioners, and we were planning to almost create guilds of, of um, you know, these independent workers. We've accelerated that because we found that if we want to be resilient, you know, our, our resilience lies in the diversity of, of our network. So we've done a lot of work to formalize those network structures. Some things we've centralized, other things we're devolving out into the network. So we're, we're really exploring these, um, 
these new ideas. Like I think John Hegel um, wrote an article the other day as well of of how the the so-called gig economy is is transforming into um, not networks of individuals but networks of guilds. And so we're really trying to to experiment with different ways of working in a networked way across multiple geographies and with multiple independence. So that's, I think that's one of the more interesting things that we're currently um, experimenting with. Okay. So um, we could move to taking some questions from the audience, but before we do that, I just want to check does any of the panelists have something that you want to add to the current round? Andrea. Maybe a, a quick thing, um, at least from a consulting business perspective, of course, uh, I think uh, anybody who is not uh, providing core business uh, has been cut out uh, from, from funding and from other enterprises. So for those people, the business got really tough. But the other problem now in this new normal, in this transitional phase is that while you can be one day at the client and work with them and go for lunch and have a casual conversation and have a productive day and uh, feel energized in the evening, even if you are tired, now doing four hours on Zoom and trying to organize and, and make sure that everything works and use vi digital collaboration platform is so tiring that uh, we, we can't actually do eight hours a day. We, we can't and our client can't because it's just, too much uh, concentration, too much intensity. And so that kind of business model uh, needs to change. We are, even if we are busy every day, we are only busy for four hours a day, roughly, because that's the maximum amount that is sustainable. So there's a big open question, what, you know, what will happen next? So can we do four hours every day forever? And can we still uh, make it profitable like that. So is, are we like, and, and we need a lot more of time to prepare and to send documentation and do this type of things than what we would need if we were on site at clients. So there's a lot of things which we still need to figure out, I think, at least in our, in our area. Actually, there's quite some upside to that um, uh, in terms of efficiency. Now that uh, clients don't want to have the kind of um, uh, luggage consultant on site anymore, you actually come to work. Um, so uh, what, what we saw in consultancy projects, specifically when it comes down to um, new business models and stuff like that, really is a massive win in terms of efficiency because you don't have to explain what you're doing, you just do what you're doing. Um, so that whole kind of mock-up work that happens um, on site of the client's offices um, basically is cut out, which leads to more efficiency and actually come into a solution, uh, which a lot of people that I work with um, enjoy a lot. So those, we are there in order to have the client see us working, um, kind of work segments are cut out of um, uh, projects, um, and you're way more efficient in actually finding the solution. Okay. I'd, it does remind me of something that I read, I can't remember where now, but about the importance of us um, distinguishing between the need for synchronous communication and what can be done asynchronously. And we, we often focus too much on everything needs to be synchronous. Uh, but I don't know, does anybody else have a comment on that? Richard. Yeah, you know, I think um, uh, that Tim said it best is like, you know, I'm home and I, in my mind's eye, everybody's back at the office and you realize everybody's home and they're spread out. And, uh, we've maintained our pairings at Menlo. So we just remote pair. We've been doing that for about seven years. So it wasn't that unusual a transition for us. But the team was so used to just being able to maybe even just call out across the room and say, you know, hey, Tim. <laughs> uh, and we lost that. We lost that intimacy in the room. Uh, the team has done some good jobs replacing that. Everybody publishes to each other which Google Meet they're in and that sort of thing. So you can jump in on people uh, from time to time. But I don't think it has yet felt as comfortable as just standing up, walking over and chatting with somebody. 
it still feels like an intrusion right now and not a terrible intrusion, not like rudeness or anything, but just kind of a surprise. <laughs> you know, suddenly somebody pops up on your screen you weren't expecting. Um, and so I, I think there's got to be some advancements of some sort in that regard uh, so that we can feel a little more comfortable moving about in our virtual teams like we do when we're all together. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, sure. if I can just add to that, I think what we've lost a little bit is um, serendipity. You know, things used to happen, we used to run into people um, and just have these serendipitous conversations. And now we're, we're needing to be very intentional about that. I was working with an executive team the other day and, um, you know, they were talking around about how in the past they just ran into each other or they just quickly walk into somebody's office and have a conversation. And now they feel like they don't, they, they don't feel like they can do that anymore in the, in the virtual space. So I'm thinking we probably need technologies that can scaffold in a way um, serendipity again, because, you know, as long as it's up to us to engineer it, it's going to feel strange. So I think a, a, an interesting challenge is, is how, how can we create the, the technologies that will, you know, just help scaffold these processes that we were so used to when we could just run into each other. Hmm. The, the virtual water cooler or the virtual coffee machine. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah, maybe to just quick build on that. I'm not sure if you can hear me. Yes. Yeah, uh, so what we try to do to build that serendipity is we have, like, like many of you probably, we have our weekly stand-ups or our weekly um, sprint meetings with 250 people, and then we create breakout sessions within Zoom. So it's a forced social interaction of serendipity because then it is a chat roulette approach, so it's just a random, random way how we mix three people together, and then they have to speak to each other for 10 minutes in the daily stand-up, and then we go back to the normal stand-up session. Maybe... Uh, a very German way to force people to have social interaction, but at least it helps you a bit to to keep that what you should just said water cooler talk and and go and meet meet people on chat roulette like uh, yeah environments. And the other one uh, to build on Andrea's point, and it was a great idea of a colleague of, of our team. What she does is she goes to the office. So what she does, she's dressing up, then she's leaving her apartment, taking a walk around the block, and going back into the apartment. And this is how she walked to the office. And when she's done, she walks back home. Um, she said that helps her a lot to get that cognitive bias solved of working from home. Okay, interesting. That that may be the answer to uh, to the first question, which I saw here from Mike. Is anyone finding it, despite no time spent traveling, work from home hours seem seem longer? Any interesting solutions to Zoom fatigue? Um, so maybe a walk around the block before and after work. Okay, we've got another question here. Um, how do you handle onboarding of new employees under these circumstances? I think, um, Tim, you already gave us a, an answer that you've moved your peer recruiting um, just simply to online. Do you want to add something? Does somebody else have a response to that? Um, actually, what we did for the first two or three people we hired through the, uh, uh, while the pandemic was going on or is going on, um, people went to the office for their first day and meet them there, just one person, meet the new employee and just show them around and give them like the office feeling, although it was empty. Uh, um, I think that that was kind of neat, but um, it actually gave you a very strange insight for your first day. So uh, uh, that that's not what we do anymore. Uh, but uh, um, you are just introduced to your team and uh, stay with them in your channel for the entire day. And actually it works just like at the office. So there uh, hasn't been too much change uh, to that at all. Okay. Anyone else on recruitment? Hasn't been a problem during the pandemic. Haven't needed to add people yet. <laughs> We, no, we look forward to getting back to that day. No, <laughs> we, we, we had a case that we actually hired a, a, a consultant shortly before the pandemic started and uh, 
this poor guy actually started on April 1st <laughs> and the pandemic was on the 13th of March. And so we were all like, oh my God, what we do? But at the end of the day, we are a distributed company anyway. So we are in many countries, we are used to work remotely, but we also used to have every two weeks or, or such a, a, a time where we all would come to the office just to share a little bit of frustration, just to vent a little bit, just to, to learn something new and stuff like that. And that kind of moment kind of disappears. So I, I can sympathize with this idea of fatigue and, and this difficulty of, of onboarding people. And I think there is also an element of physicality in doing that, and uh, um, which we don't have at the moment. So I'm looking forward from to the moment where we could do that again in the future. Okay. We figured out how to do Zoom tales, you know, cocktails over Zoom. Uh, I remember one night I left my wife who also works at uh, Menlo uh, on, on a Zoom tales call where people are just drinking margaritas and such. I went out and played a whole round of golf and came home and they were still on the call. So uh, those can work pretty well. Uh, you know, I think we have to find different structures to have casual interactions with our team. Uh, I'm thinking, Sonia, some new technologies, maybe Zoom just adds this thing where, where a, a video Zoom just passes through the screen and we're like, hey, you. <laughs> yeah, we could just have people randomly passing by each other. You know, I, I think one of the things we have found is that, um, you know, as wonderful as many of these online video chat technologies are and how critical they are to our infrastructure at the moment, uh, we have to be careful to not allow ourselves to box ourselves in to the way the technology works. You know, I think we can make demands on technology, we can keep searching for new ones to come along, but, but ultimately let's not stay satisfied that the way Zoom works today or Google Meets or WebEx or uh, Microsoft Teams is the way we have to work. Um, those, those platforms themselves have to evolve and most of us are in the software community, maybe we have to help evolve them. Okay. So here's a different question from Martin. Um, with a PPE crisis, <clears throat> that has been faced around the world. Do you see an over-reliance on imports making consumers more conscious and or governments? Well, I think what we've learned is we've learned how important supply chains are and the supply chains themselves have lags in them. And when you interrupt the supply chain, as we've done over uh, the last eight weeks, suddenly that one click purchase on Amazon doesn't show up on your door within the next 15 minutes. Sometimes it takes eight weeks and we're at least becoming fully aware of the lag time inside of supply chains, mainly due to shipping uh, distances and so on. So I, I think we'll probably have to societally figure out how do we get some of our critical supply chain pieces closer to where the need is as opposed to we can do this anywhere and just keep filling the supply chain from 5,000 miles away. Okay, thanks Richard. Next question I've got here from Aaron. Why have we not seen a massive push? Uh, sorry, my screen just went up. Why have we not seen a massive push to create virtual startups across hundreds of industries? This could help tens of millions find new work, build equity, start a new economy. Who wants to take that one? It's a nasty one. Uh, but I'm, I'm going to go with it. I mean, I think uh, that's, uh, that's a great idea, but the problem boils down to what we discussed before, I think, that uh, nobody feels like putting capital anywhere at the moment because it's too risky, it's too volatile. And uh, while the idea is good, we have to consider that the infrastructure is not trivial. So uh, technology is one piece, but also uh, the infrastructure in terms of capability to hire people, uh, um, that work in different countries and uh, there's a lot of, uh, of complications still in, in pulling off something like that virtually, completely virtually. I'm sure there are some businesses who successfully did it, but uh, as I said, there is probably 
all the businesses which are kind of using um, a bit of a salami tactic, no? slicing one piece at a time and growing based on the consumption without too much uh, upfront investment, those things uh, on the digital world might work, but anything else which requires massive up upfront investment or provision of material and assets, yeah, I don't think anybody's gonna take the risk at the moment to do anything like that. Mm. Here's another question from uh, Hogir, if I've got the pronunciation uh, correct. Were there any specific tools or frameworks which you found very helpful in order to guide your organization through um, the impact of the pandemic? So tools or frameworks, other than Zoom, I guess. Um, I'll take, well, I, I have a biased view, Peter. Um, I think we've, we've found um, Dave's Kinevan framework very useful to um, guide ourselves <laughs> and, uh, and our clients through, the, through, the, through this. I think, um, you know, it, it was interesting before the pandemic hit, he actually renamed the central, I don't know how many people know about Kinevan, but it's a, a, a framework that helps us identify different systemic contexts. And the, the, center, um, the center domain used to be called disorder. And just before all of this happened, he renamed it to confused. And um, we've, um, I, I think there's so many you know, decision makers who really just find themselves in that space of just confusion and not understanding what's going on, what to do. I don't think we're in perpetual chaos. But I think you know, just being able to have those conversations, you know, even internally, of how do we... How do we exit this confusion? How do we acknowledge that it's normal, that we feel like this, but then how do we, how do we, how do we get out of this? So I've, I, I realize it's a very biased answer, but, but um, it, it, it's, it's an authentic one. We, we found Kinevan to be very helpful. Cool. Who else has found some tools or frameworks that have helped you? Andrea, you're going to tell us organic agility. Yeah, but I, I didn't want to go so much into detail. I think uh, what we have learned that is helpful is that we need to learn to make everything explicit. And uh, while we were in, in a face-to-face -face mode, a lot of things were kind of intuitive because we built it in our own ritual. We, we were accustomed to those type of things. And now we just shifted uh, to work on on digital media. And I think we still need to find the right rituals, the right way of... of uh, of understanding what other people mean just by watching some face on the video, right? And, uh, and what I think is important is that while before the video conf was the exception and now becomes the norm, we need a way to approach video conferencing and Zoom communication, for example, in a, in a much more sustainable way than now. So it's not like a full one hour completely and you can't schedule meeting back to back. I mean, before at least we had the physical time to move from one meeting room to another, maybe bump into each other, ever disconnect for a, for a couple of seconds, drink a glass of water or something. And now we are boom, 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 one after the next without even moving sometimes. And that's absolutely killing. So I think uh, it's not so much about tools and framework, but it's really about uh, trying to find the space and the respect of, uh, um, of our human body as well, but also of the necessity of our brain to disconnect and get used to the new context, not to mix up all the things at once. So I find the idea of running out uh, at lunch, uh, going for a walk and coming back in the lunch break, or actually dressing up, going to the office and coming back <laughs> home again and pretending to be in the office and then going back home in the evening. So all of these rituals that everybody builds I think are happy to, to actually give a little bit of, of, of pace to our brain to recover also, because otherwise we are eight hours straight uh, switching context the whole time, which we all know, the people who work in an agile environment all know is one of the most tiring and unproductive thing to do, to put context switching and multitasking all the time. And that's, that is what is consuming us more. And I think this is why we feel all so tired after four hours of of Zoom because we are in Zoom with the face, we are typing in a chat somewhere else, we are moving uh, drawings on a collaborative board all at the same time. And all of this is like, is not built into our own uh, normal ritual. So we don't have that 
part and we can't socialize yet on Zoom. So we need to find ways to socialize and, uh, and uh, get to know each other and find better way to communicate also on an emotional level. Okay. I'm just looking for the next relevant question. Um, so here's an, uh, another question from Hogir. Um, did you observe a relevant positive or negative if, uh, effect emerge in your organization that really surprised you. So just to paraphrase that, what has surprised you? Christoph, it looks like you have your hand up. Yeah, because this is really the, the, the one thing that I learned throughout the crisis um, that, that really made me kind of puzzled, um, the solidarity, um, really coping with those unforeseen situations um, that we experienced was just crazy. So. Um, people kind of pooling their vacation days to give uh, parents to um, kids um, additional vacation days. Um, the working student doing read out session to kids um, via Zoom in order to have uh, working parents um, be not in charge for the children for two two hours straight. So, so all the kind of solidarity and, and the kind of inclusion that that the organization showed really was my most surprising moment um, in, a, in a really positive way. So I did not experience that. Um, so it was really kind of a one group kind of thing once again that, that just happened naturally. Um, and that for me was, was over all of the bad things, uh, including not being able to travel, that was the one thing that really yeah, it got me some goosebumps. Okay. Who Humans else? are human in a crisis um, are, and, and more human. Um, and, and that's a good news. Okay, someone else with something surprising that has surprised you? Richard. You know, we had to figure out how to close business remotely and uh, usually the leading edge of every project we work on is this piece we call high-tech anthropology, which is go out into the world, study the users we're going to ultimately serve with the software we're gonna design and study them in their native environment. Well. No planes, no visits, no offices to go to anyways. And one of our high-tech anthropologists leaned in and she said, this will be so exciting to figure out how to do this. And all I could think at that moment was, oh, thank you, Molly. Thank you for saying that. I, I, that was so comforting for me to hear as the CEO that our team saw these new challenges, not as, oh, woe is me, how are we going to do this, but rather an exciting new opportunity to figure things out. And, and I'm with Christoph. I, I see the team coming together in ways for each other, uh, both in a business context and in a personal context. And uh, everybody knows, you know, I mean, maybe the beautiful thing of this pandemic is we can at least all step back and say, I didn't do this. This isn't my fault. We, you know, our business was impacted, uh, you know, our, our work lives were impacted, but we didn't do this. It wasn't, wasn't some at least for each of us individually, some stupid CEO error. Okay. What else has been surprising? Well, I can say also from our side, I think the human factor is definitely something that uh, emerged more. Uh, in the crisis, everybody understood we need to stick together. We need to do whatever we can, even if not all of all of our uh, people reacted in the same way, but it was, uh, it was very, very good to see how everybody was not even asking help, offered help and uh, to support each other, is even in the crisis by offering services and by saying, hey, no worries. Uh, I mean, we even have uh, a couple of guys, I think they did a training in the morning in Europe and a training in the evening in the US to cover two time zone. And uh, that's kind of like, wow. <laughs> I, I wouldn't have asked to do it, but some people did it. So it's, it's kind of, yeah, very cool to see how people, when they recognize it's a crisis, they, they stick together. And another moment uh, for us is when we ask people, okay, now we need to reduce the cost and we would like everybody to kind of lower their salary and, uh, you know, keep on, keep on working. It's better to have a work with less salary than having no work at all. 
and, um, and and everybody was like, of course. I mean, the situation is so crap that uh, let's get together and let's figure out how to to get things going again. And we were like, oh wow, this was an easy sell. You know, you never would have expected people to react so positively anyway. And and thanks to the effort of everybody, we are now in a position where we can start ramping up again, uh, even if uh, things are not stable at all. But we are addressing so many different uh, areas that we kind of can start pulling benefits out of all these things. And I think whatever happens, we will uh, be able to adapt quickly again. So we are quite resilient in that and we demonstrated. So I'm very confident and I'm positively surprised about how our organization reacted. Tim or Tobias, anything from you? I was, I was genuinely surprised how quickly everything moved to remote. I think it, we had like a head start of a couple of days uh, where we knew that we were about to do that and go remote. And um, everything just worked out perfectly from uh, moving uh, um, accountants with their Windows servers and Windows software uh, to remote was uh, was, <laughs> was uh, deemed undoable before that and just took us two days. And uh, that, that was really surprising uh, and good to see. And the other thing I was surprised to see that um, is that productivity really went up. Of course, it's a crisis. Everybody's in crisis mode. And uh, all, we all know that people work too much and too hard, but, uh, but still we were, we were expecting uh, productivity to slump and still stress go up. Uh, uh, but we didn't didn't see that. So um, uh, if you had asked me a year ago if it was uh, uh, how productivity would have developed, I'd say, okay, that's not going to happen. That's not going to be better uh, uh, than co-located. And uh, that really gave us um, the opportunity to think about what we're going to do in the future, because I think, as Richard said, we, we're definitely going to go to a hybrid uh, model and not a uh, fully co-located, fully remote thing. Okay, thanks, Tim. Yeah, not too much to add from my side. Probably the same pattern that so many mentioned already, the solidarity or how you can actually create a team around the virtual environment. When we were speaking about onboarding, by the way, we onboarded 35 people in that um, phase. And some of them have never seen another one physically yet. Uh, it's all through video. And it seems to work because no one quit so far. Um, but... Uh, maybe, maybe one other thing that was very interesting for me was not from our own organization, but when speaking to others. So we, we had kind of a canary in the coal mine as well. We had an Italian and a Spanish office going into remote work two weeks before the rest of our organization. So we already knew what was happening. But uh, when I was speaking to neighbors then in, in Germany or when I had conversations with other rather traditional industries, they just said, okay, it's undoable because 10% of the workforce has a, a, a laptop at all. So everybody else is on desktop PCs. How do I get a desktop back to their room? And, and how do I make them uh, work from, from home if I don't have any laptops? And I tried to order laptops and it takes me seven to eight months. So to me, the surprise was when I was always thinking that I would have you know, a broader perspective on the industry, I did not realize how much I'm already living in the filter bubble of um, young Berlin hipsters with laptops in a work environment and was so arrogant to, to realize how many are still bound to, to, an old, yeah, to an older IT and just are not physically capable of running uh, remotely. Mm. Interesting. Okay. So I think um, the last question um, before we do a closing round um, from Martin, what's one thing you're most grateful that COVID has accelerated your learning in? Thank you. you know, I, there's a tradition in Menlo whenever we're faced with anything uh, is if, if an idea comes up, our team's response is, well, let's run the experiment. Let's see what happens. Let's try it. And so we have this attitude at Menlo of take action versus take a meeting. Uh, so, uh, what I've been delighted to see is how fast the experimentation cycle is going right now. Um, we're not waiting at all. We're trying stuff. Uh, it's, it's just, it's fun to see, uh, you know, it's, it's energizing. So I think that part for me, um, uh, the accelerated learning that's happening from trying new things, from running those experiments, 
uh, has been, I, I think, again, something we'll look back on and say, huh, I thought we moved pretty fast in the past. Uh, but now it's, uh, you know, I mean, I'm sure all of us had that experience of, you know, one day we were in the office and the next day we weren't. And you're making this quick mad dash scramble to make sure everybody's got what they need and, and it's all going to work for them. And it, it started working and I didn't think it would go that fast. So really proud of how the team responded, how they all uh, reacted with uh, as much positive emotion as, as they could. And I think in that kind of environment, um, there was a lot of learning going on. There still is. Thanks, Richard. Anybody else seen some acceleration in learning in a particular space? Maybe a little thing we, we just discussed. So we are in the middle of the Agile 42 Innovation Sprint uh, this week, and this event is just uh, the, the closing for us of the first day. We started this morning and uh, we kicked off everybody uh, to create a new game. Uh, that we we want to share with everyone when it's when it's finished, and uh, I've I've been positively surprised on how fast people start uh, questioning or asking more about uh, the business model, about monetiz monetization, about how do we make money. So everybody under the crisis immediately started challenging what is you know what is profitable, what is not, where are we costing, where are we not costing, and. Uh, in normal condition, people would just go out and do the work at the client. But in this situation, it felt like everybody wanted to be a part of it, wanted to understand more, wanted to learn more about how can we act the business model in a way that will make us uh, uh, more profitable, but primarily will help us help client in a different way from what we are doing today. So that was positively surprising, definitely. And this is a great learning, I think, for the organization. You created a whole bunch of new CEOs, Andrea. Okay. Why not? It's a new yeah. business model. We're going to rent CEOs uh, around now, and it's probably not a bad idea. The agile CEO. I like it. Cool. Anyone else regarding accelerated learning? I think, Peter, and, and I don't know, this might be a combination of this question and the previous one, but I think something that surprised me and that Personally, I've had to, you know, I've, I've experienced a lot of, lot of accelerated learning is the, um, the surprising level of depth and authenticity that you can achieve in workshops facilitated virtually. Um, you know, so some of, some of the workshops we, we do, um, you know, kind of go into, I almost want to say the unconscious processes and the psychodynamics of teams. And it requires quite deep and authentic sharing. And I had very big reservations about um, facilitating sessions like that virtually because you, you can't read body language, you know, you can't read the dynamics of, of the team. And I have been pleasantly surprised by, you know, it, it's almost as if you get a level of more authentic sharing in this weird, this, you know, discombobulating platform. Um, and also just the, the, the learning to be able to hold those kind of spaces has, you know, that, that's been something that I, I had to get skilled up with very quickly. But so it's a bit of a combination for your two questions. Okay, thank you. You know, Sonia, I have a thought on this. Um, you know, in a lot of corporate environments, the, the more important you are, the higher up you are, the bigger your office, the bigger your desk. Yeah, you know, and it's one of the reasons my co-founder and I just sit at the same five foot tables as everybody else, because it at least knocks a few of those things down. We don't have an office, we sit out in the room. In the Zoom world, at least, all of our boxes are exactly the same size. It's, it's really kind of leveled that playing field just a little. Okay, interesting. All right, so as we um, bring this interesting conversation to um, to a close i'd like to give each of you an opportunity to take a minute or so just to share with us um, what do you think matters most we've been in this in this um, um, situation of lockdown more or less for four months or so now and as we try to navigate the remainder of this with the fear and risk of a second wave at the end of the year and all the things that we don't know anything about. What, what do you think 
what do you want to share with us that you think is the most important thing? Let's start with Christoph. I think what, what, what this all proved to me, um, which is why I'm in the office right now um, and still uh, try to connect to, to people physically, um, uh, is, is really human connectivity um, is, is key to a lot of things that we do. So we're technically um, enabled. So we're people from the future doing magic, which uh, technically enables us to do all of the things that we can do right now. Nonetheless, um, uh, however this uh, may end, the in-room meeting um, is always going to be something special and true human collaboration is in-room collaboration. So I, I kind of, saying that feels like being a dinosaur, but I very much look forward to a time where we find a coping mechanism um, with all of that uh, that will help us to get back to true human connectivity. Um, so for me, this is all kind of an interim situation that I'm economically and, and personally coping well with. It's just not the best time to be alive is, is not that time. And it will never be. <laughs> Tim, let's go to you. You're muted at the moment. There we go. Uh, my biggest concern right now is that uh, this is not sustainable. We need to change things uh, around and do something about this because uh, uh, I think we all feel that we're doing too much and that's too stressful and it's, it's not easy to discuss what to change and it's not easy to feel how stressed somebody is because maybe you just don't see them for weeks. And um, I'm not quite sure how that's going to work out, what we're going to do about this. And uh, I think we'll most likely will need to change some fundamental beliefs in how work works. And we really need to, to move around there and uh, uh, need to find a new way of uh, um, uh, spending time working uh, without uh, being totally stressed out. I don't know how it's going to work out. I don't know what we're going to do about this, but there need, there has to be some change if this um, carries on. Okay. Interesting. So similar vein. Andrea, what about you? Well, I, I'm, I agree with what Christoph and, and Tim said. I mean, we are human. We are used to social system. We are used to interact. We are even used uh, to, to get close to one another. Tactile feeling is important. Uh, you know, exchanging things directly is important. So, and the current situation impedes us. This, you know, new boundaries impede us to, to, to do that. So we need to, to find ways in which we can get that back in, in a way or another, which will require proximity probably again, or we require a different way to approach uh, communication than what we have today, which is good for emergencies kind of working, but I agree with Tim, it's not going to be uh, sustainable for, for a long term. And also we have to think about all of those businesses which have been impeded from government to actually operate. Everything in tourism, in, in uh, uh, leisure, entertainment, all of those places where people go to relax are closed because you can't actually go and relax. because unless you have a big enough space. So there's a lot of stress building up uh, in the world and I feel like it is like a ticking bomb. At a certain point, people would just, you know, uh, explode and, and give up. From an economical perspective, I think the current situation going on um, is putting us in a position where we can't make any assumption, we can't assume anything, we need to test and validate everything before we put the money on it. Um, and uh, that is something we learn to do very well, I think, and we should be continuing doing that, uh, always testing and validating, and never assume things will be uh, the same for longer than a day or a week, because uh, it's still things are changing very rapidly. We can't uh, uh, say this is a new normal in a week, there is a new normal, and then yet another new normal, so I don't think, uh, probably as Sonia said at the beginning, normal will be changing continuously, will not be stability anymore. So we all need to get used to a different, probably social system even, that help us navigating through these times. Okay, well, we'll come to that in, in a moment. Um, Tobias, what do you have to add? No, I'd like to build on what Andrea just said. I think for me that is, that is the one thing. From an organization perspective, we have been already pretty much organized for a time like that, but you often use that term of, you know, new normal, flex one, whatever. 
but it made me very conscious of the yeah of the relationship that we have with the content that we create for those of you we generate four billion views a month for 500 million people each month and uh, we knew that there is some you know some importance to it and and how much attitude we have to have behind that um, and we were always speaking about it but now it makes it for me way more obvious how much of an active role we have to play with uh, keeping an attitude um, creating values and make them accessible for everybody because I really think that will be a defining decade now in how you communicate um, externally and not only you, your team but everybody else that will have interaction with you will ask for a specific attitude and wants to see it and wants to have it explicit and that is a probably a role that everybody of us who has has a role in digital and communications have to be aware of because um, that might really be a even even a danger for the existing structures that we have and we have to be really aware of what we're doing here and that is that was probably my learning curve over the last last six months um, what a what a chance what a burden it can be to um, to reach so many people every month okay so. Um, store of challenges. Richard, what do you have from across the Atlantic? Um, there we go. Um, you know, with, I think all of us as humans, as organizations, we strive for stasis, right? We get into some stable mode and keep going. Uh, and that was certainly the case for me personally and, and within the context of Menlo. And for the 19 years we've been in business, our principles and our practices married so well together that they felt like one. And suddenly so many of our practices were just taken away. Uh, you know, in the room, daily stand-up meetings, pair programming, two people sitting next to one another, overhearing one another, being able to shout across the room when you wanted to talk to somebody else. That when the practices were taken away, it probably felt for 90 days for me like the principles had gone with them, but they hadn't. Uh, the principles of collaboration, of trust, of teamwork, of building relationships between people, they're all still there. We had to start to reformulate, and we did quickly. I probably was the laggard on the team. I think the old man was not quite ready to adjust and sort of start over again and build a new startup company out of what we had created over 19 years. I just wanted it to stay the same. It was so fun. It was so joyful. But now that I've watched us reformulate the new practices, and we'll have to do it again. We'll have to do it again when we come out on the tail end of all of this stuff. Uh, maybe out of uh, uh, two things I'll grab away from this, uh, from Andrea. Uh, one is a new normal is the new normal, you know, that, that we're going to be constantly adjusting and we have to be ready for that. And perhaps the tagline of Agile 42 is, uh, is the most important of all. Don't panic. <laughs> All right, thanks for that. And so maybe we'll look forward to a new book describing uh, this in the future. Um, so, Sonia, I have reserved the last word for the lady, of course. Thanks, Peter. I hope you don't regret it. Um, I, uh, I think for me, um, one of my one of my favorite quotes that I'll I'll start off with is by Diego Espinosa, who says, "We have outsourced our relationship with uncertainty to certainty merchants." And I think many many leaders, change practitioners, you know, entire industries have kind of stepped into that certainty merchant role. And you know, linking to what Richard and Andrea said now as well is is I think probably one of the most important things is for us to re-befriend uncertainty and to help our people do the same. Um, I think if we, if, we don't, if we don't do that, we're going to sit with um, huge psychosocial issues. I think our people are going to burn out, but I also think that we're going to keep seeing these populist leaders. Um, you know, um, a friend of mine, Alicia Juarero, said, if we can't collectively learn to cope with uncertainty, every, anybody who promises certainty will always have a following. And personally, I don't think that the people who promises certainty are the ones that we need 
to have a following. So I think for me, the most important thing is, is to make, make friends with, with uncertainty because I, I do think that is the, not, not even the new normal, it is the normal. Um, so, yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. Yeah, I couldn't that. resist. Look at what I have here, Andrea. <laughs> okay. okay. Yeah. So, thank you. I want to thank our audience for uh, staying with us for 90 minutes. I want to thank our panelists for giving up their time generously. Those of you who feel able and willing, please make a donation to the charity that was shared earlier. And uh, other than that, I declare this session closed. Thank you very much. Thanks, Peter. Bye-bye. Thank you.